Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason Baby 2016 Inman. Welcome to your mind university because we are Geek History Lesson, the podcast that usually teaches you about one character, construct, or book in a little bit less than an hour. But we're not doing that this week because, Ashley, I don't know if you heard... Did you hear that we're in a new year? Only if you follow the Julian calendar, but I did hear something about that. Very true, Professor. Well done. Thank you're, you. Like, you're bringing some science in this, straight up. <laughs> Even though we're mostly a pop culture podcast, you slot in that science. Every once in a while. Now, I just wanted to state that every year, if you've been listening to our podcast, when we get to the new year, we always like to go back to the previous year and talk about the best things, the things that we liked about it. We did a best of 2015, best of 2014. We did not do a best of 2013 because the podcast didn't exist back then. That's true. So uh, bad on us. But <laughs> we'll get to that episode eventually. I think the key point there is that it is what we as individuals think is the best of 2016. Exactly. We're going to be talking about best of 16. And it, again, Ashley is exactly right. We're going to be talking about what we thought was the best, not objectively, mm. because I think that would be completely different lists. Uh, our categories, of course, on this podcast, uh, we're going to cover comics. Mm -hmm. We're going to cover movies. Mm -hmm. We have a new category comic book movies. What? Because, uh, <laughs> Can't imagine why that would be necessary. Well, I decided to add that because there are so many comic book movies slated going forward that, like, I think there are enough. There was, like, 17 this year, correct? Yeah, about 100,000. Yep. <laughs> uh, next category is TV, mm -hmm. prose books, mm -hmm. podcasts, and then we added this last year, and it's one of my favorite categories, our favorite geek history lesson episode, because we are self-indulgent. Because we want to pat ourselves on the back one That's last right. time. Uh, and just to let you know, real quick, you can find our comic choices, only our comic book choices, at geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. We'll have little Amazon widgets up there. You can click on them, and you can start off your 2017 right with some good reading. With some good reading. All right, so let's just jump right into, or I guess not jump right into, we're going to actually go backwards into 2016. Jump backwards. The first category comic books, funny books. Ashley, let's jump back into the way, way back machine to the old year of 2016. Mm, so long ago. So many <sighs> memories. How different we looked back then. Right? Oh, so much younger. Ashley, <laughs> in your opinion, yes. what was the best comic book of 2016. Now, before you say your choice, we do have this little rule mm. where the comic book, your comic book choice has to have had published at least four issues in said year. Yep, because so, you kept me from it being Gotham Academy the first year. That's right. <laughs> I am Trixie. Which I will never forget. I am Trixie like that. Okay, so Ashley, what is your best comic book of 2016? Okay, I know so many people who are listening to this are going to laugh at me, but I stand by this as what I think is the best comic book of 2016. And I have to say, there were a ton of great comics that came out this year. This was a good year for comic books. Especially on the DC side. Um, I almost went with the Reaper. Wait a minute, Ashley. But uh, you love DC and you hate Marvel, right? Uh, that is incorrect. No, uh, let no, me no, no, Ashley. I read the internet and uh, <laughs> the internet is uh, true. You hate Marvel. You must have missed my most recent tweet about the Hellcat series and how amazing <laughs> it is. Um, uh, I think I'm a pretty well-rounded reader. But so I did pick a comic that is published by DC, but it's not, I think, <gasps> traditionally thought of as a DC comic. OK. Uh, I think the Flintstones is the greatest series of 2016. Interesting. Now, tell us a little bit about this series. OK, so. So I have the description, and I was going to read it, but it's quite lengthy. Just uh, summarize it then. Um, so you you know the Flintstones. I mean, come Flintstones, on. Flintstones. Meet the Flintstones. Here come the copyright lawyers right now. <laughs> right. Less than 11 <laughs> seconds. Um, but think of that, and through the lens of Bedrock, you examine... Um, episodic, because it, there is some continuity, but it's not an overarching narrative... Um, you know, peaks at the human condition. Now, let me uh, state this. This is part of the Hanna-Barbera DC Comics team up, right? Where they're reimagining those classic cartoons in new ways. Yes. So it looks like Bedrock. It smells like Bedrock. They're all dressed the way you think they're dressed. You see Barney Rubble's family. You see Fred Flintstone's family. But there's a whole issue that deals with the fact that Fred and Barney are veterans of war and what mm -hmm. that means and what it's like to be a veteran and some of the mental health issues that come along with that. There's an issue that deals all with uh, science and religion. And, and each, each issue so far has had a different theme. They have. And it's like all social issues, right? They are all social issues and 
I know that might sound really silly, but it's actually completely incredible. Uh, Steve Pugh is the head artist. There are sometimes guest artists who step in, and uh-huh. he does a really great job at drawing these characters as truly ancient and almost alien. Who's the writer? Uh, Mark Russell. Mark Russell. Um, and, and hats off to Mark Russell, because I don't understand how he pitched such an amazing series. Um, but you will, if you read the eight issues that are out so far, I guarantee you're going to come across one that's going to hit you really deep in your heart and is going to deal with something that you're dealing with or that you've experienced. And the fact that it's dressed up with a really cute pet dinosaur every once in a while sometimes makes it a little easier to digest. What was it about the series that made you be like, this has to be the best comic of 2016? Like, what was it? It was, I think, the most surprising to me. Like, That's why? Okay, cool. I think I, I really Really like Scooby Apocalypse. Yes, um, and I almost made Scooby Apocalypse my number one. Oh, interesting! I wanted to make it a comic that I look forward to reading uh, every month or bi monthly whenever it comes mm-hmm. out. And Flintstones, as soon as I get it, I always read it. I think it is beautiful, and I didn't know that a Flintstones comic could actually make me have as strong an emotional response as I've had. And I've had a stronger emotional response to this series beyond just like, oh, that's cool, or like, oh, I'm really impressed with the art. Um, than almost anything else that I read this year. So it absolutely had to be my choice. I'm going to be honest with you. When they announced uh, the Flintstones, this was the one that I was probably looking forward to the least. I will agree. I thought it was going to be silly. And I didn't see any way they were going to be able to pull it off. And then I read the first issue and I was like, interesting. Mm -hmm. I read the second issue. I was like, interesting. I read the third issue and I was like, this is amazing. And it has been, this is amazing, every issue since. This, I think, is going to be a run that is going to be an amazing trade that you try to convince people to read. You're going to give you're going to give this to people as birthday gifts yes. and Hanukkah gifts and any any and, other occasion yeah. gifts and they're going to look at you like a weirdo. They're going to read it 6 months later and, and they're like, going to oh thank you yeah, yeah, for yeah. giving it. You're going to be like, "Man, you got to borrow my series the Flintstones." Everybody's going to be like, "No." And you're going to be like, "No, no, no. Seriously, you need to read the Flintstones." And they have some of the most amazing variant covers. Uh Dustin yeah. Wynn did one of my favorite ones that I managed to get my hands on. Uh but like again, the art aspect as well j- uh, lives up to the creative storytelling. So yeah, Flintstone. Nice. Cool. Great choice. Thank you. What do you have uh, for your best comic of 2016? Well, 2016, you are correct. There were a lot of great comic books. There were a lot of great independent comic books. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of Marvel good comic books. There were a lot of DC good comic books. Like, this was a strong year for comic books. It was this a really is, great year on the publishing side. Oh, heck yeah. This was a really, really good year for comic books. But I'm kind of glad that what I chose is the best of 2016 comic book series, I think deservedly deserves it (laughs) because... Great set of adjectives. I love it. Thank you. Uh, Because it's the first superhero ever. Uh, Superman. I knew it. (laughs) My best comic book of 2016 is the Superman ongoing series. It is the best the Superman title has been in a decade. It is the best book of DC Rebirth. It is 100%. And here's a little synopsis of, let me tell you uh, why it's changed. Okay. When the Man of Steel died defending his adopted home, it seemed that the spirit of truth and justice he represented was extinguished forever. But watching from the sidelines was another Superman. Older, wiser, more experienced. And with his wife, Lois Lane, and their son, Jonathan Kent, he is trying to make his way in the world. And he learns that his son has superpowers. Can the son of Superman harness his newly emerging powers in time to resist the annihilation of humanity? This is written by Peter J. Tomasi and Patrick Gleason. Patrick Gleason also does art. There's also been art by Doug Monkey, Jorge Jimenez, uh, Mick Gray, Jaime Mendoza, John Calise, uh, Will Quintana, and Alejandro Sanchez. That's the entire team. The art colors all of them. It is also um, a, a bi-monthly series, so yes, you get the it. art duties are significant. You get it twice a month. Um, I never thought, I've never liked the son of Superman concept. Mm -hmm. I really have because I've always been one of those people that I've kind of believed I'm in the Superman camp and you know, I'm a big Superman fan because I come from the state of Kansas. I come from the camp that Superman and Lois can't have children. Because he's an alien. Because he's a different species. Mm-hmm. The DNA will not mix. Mm-hmm. Because I kind of help. I feel that that makes adds to Superman always needs to be a little bit tragic. He the, does. The idea that Pa Kent died from a heart attack because Superman can stop him. The idea that him and Lois can't ever have a baby because they're different species. So when we introduce a Superman that has a child, son of Superman, mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know about this. 
it works so well. And I think the reason it works so well is because I had the chance to interview these two at San Diego Mm Comic-Con. And they both have children. Mm -hmm. And they both said that they write John as one of their kids. I love John so much. Yes, exactly right. (laughs) Jonathan Kent, the son of Superman, is this character that shouldn't work, and he totally works. And this book bleeds with the emotion about being a father, being a family. The stories are so simple. The art is so awesome. And literally, Superman number seven, uh, to specifically point out an issue, I think is one of the best comic books I've read in years. Mm-hmm. It's literally a story where the three of them go to the county fair. And, oh, I know that And issue. Lois is like, hey, you can't go off saving the world. You got to spend some time with John. And it's about Superman sneaking off and saving the world without Lois catching him. Mm-hmm. And then at the very end of the issue, John lets the cat out of the bag and Lois figures it out. <laughs> um, and that's the entire issue. It's them at the county fair. And it's so heartfelt Mm -hmm. and it's so real and I know what you're saying you're like how can a character like Superman be so real this run is so real now for people that haven't read Superman or people that don't know what DC Rebirth is about, you might be a little confused because they mentioned the other Superman. I think you can gloss over it for the most part. I kind of think you can pick up volume one of this this series and kind of jump right into it. And it's it's perfection. It is the best parts of superhero comic book storytelling. It has heart. It has great action. It has great art. And... Um, it has some really nice nods to continuity. Plus, Lois Lane puts on a suit of bat armor. And, she, and it's really cool. Yep. Do you think this is shaping up to be one of the definitive Superman runs? Um, I cannot say that right now mm-hmm. because the title has only been around for six months. That's true. And, I, and I'm one of those believers that you cannot give something a definite run until it's been for a year. Now, they are at issue 12. And with use, the double shipping. With the double shipping. I'm going to wait until they get to 24. Mm -hmm. Once they get to 24, we'll see. I will say that if they go as strong as they do, or they are as strong as they are now, if they go that strong to 24, without a doubt, yes. Nice. No doubt this will go down in the pantheon of one of the strongest Superman runs of all time. And it's kind of cool that it's happening right now. I also think um, it's interesting that this is a married Superman. Yes. This, it's really, the book should be called Superman Family. Something that DC, <laughs> uh, DC, by the way, shied away from for a long time. Yes. Yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, okay. So Superman's my choice. Flintstones is your choice. Uh, what were some honorable mentions that almost grabbed your best comic book of 2016? Uh, the Archie reboot uh, was almost my choice, but uh-huh. that was my choice last year. Yep. <laughs> so I couldn't repeat it. Um, I just think that series like just continues to be uh, amazing and really, really beautiful. I almost picked Superman Mm -hmm. because I do think objectively it is the best book coming out of Rebirth right now. But I was 99.999% sure that it was going to be your choice. Good good call. Um, Like I said, I almost gave it to um, I almost gave it to Scooby Apocalypse because I'm Mm -hmm. really enjoying Scooby Apocalypse. I do think Flintstones is the best of those four books. So Mm -hmm. Um, I almost gave it to Miss Marvel. Interesting. um, Because Miss Marvel, she's a side character so she hasn't been affected by a lot of this post Secret Wars Civil War 2 like she's involved in those events but her solo title doesn't deal with that and I think it continues to be one of the greatest things that Marvel's done and one of their greatest accomplishments in the last I don't know a couple of years some of my uh, honorable mentions were the Star Wars Darth Vader comic book series which was my pick last year uh-huh. it ended this year it ended on a high note uh, Sheriff of Babylon completed this year which mm-hmm. almost made it into my list and a Marvel title that I'm really enjoying but it only has has three, uh, what only has like five issues or so is Power Man and Iron Fist. Oh, I like that one too. I like the book a lot. I don't think it's strong enough to take the best spot, but it's really, really good. Maybe next year. Yeah. All right. So let's move into movies. Ashley. Yes. What is your best movie of 2016? Well, I I almost wanted made it a trifecta of animated movies uh, because listeners may remember the first year we did this, I said Big Hero 6. And last year I said The Good Dinosaur, yep. which I took more heat for than almost anything I've ever. Ah, screw him. Um, screw I, him. 
almost gave it to Moana, and I want to give Moana just like a great, like the biggest honorable I mention. Figured you, I figured you would give it to Moana. Um, I have to give it to a little independent film called Moonlight. What is that? I don't know. I haven't heard of this movie. Well, Moonlight is a 2016 American drama film written and directed by Barry Jenkins based on the play in Moonlight Black Boys Look Blue by Terrell Alvin McCraney. That's a great title. I know. It is a great title. Um, the people who you may recognize from this play are the singer Janelle Monáe. Uh, Naomi Harris, who's the sexy new money penny in the James Bond franchise, and Mayor Shala Ali, who was uh, Cottonmouth and Remy Danton in House of Cards. Well, he was Cottonmouth and Luke Cage, not in House of Cards. Well, he may also <laughs> have been <laughs> Cottonmouth in House way, of Cards. The way you made it sound was like Cottonmouth in House of Cards, um, which would make that show very interesting. Yeah, he's also currently nominated for a Golden Globe for the so there. Um, it's basically came in and swept all of the independent awards, and now it is going on and yeah. sweeping some of the bigger um, awards. It focuses on on uh, a young boy growing up in Miami to a mother who is uh, addicted to drugs. And the first chapter is called Little. The second chapter is called Chiron. And the third chapter is called Black. It is three different and integral parts in his life and the people who come in and out of them and how they change and how he either transcends or fails to transcend the place that he comes from. I think it is visually the most beautiful movie that I have seen this year. I think it is the best acting that I've seen in a movie this year, and I think it is the most important movie that I've seen this year. I think the subject matter that it deals with and the respect with which it deals with some really difficult issues um, culturally and otherwise are really what make Moonlight worth sitting through. It's a 90-minute movie, but it's a tough it's mm-hmm. a tough 90 minutes. It's really, really sad, and I think that... Moonlight is a case for why independent cinema is as important as it is because you don't get small, incredible films like this coming out of big budget studio systems. And I think it is so wonderful that this is being celebrated. And I didn't talk a lot about the plot because, like I said, it's only 90 minutes. Yeah. And I can't talk about it that much without giving it no, away. No, you, you can't describe the plot at all. But I guarantee you, you have seen the trailer with Mayor Shala Ali and the little boy swimming in the ocean. Yep. And I would just, it's still out in theaters, very select uh, listings, but I would really recommend going and checking out Moon Knight. It made me cry. Moonlight. Moonlight. Not Moon Knight. Moon, Moon Knight is a sequel. Moon Knight is another guy. It is a sequel. <laughs> yes, Moonlight. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that was my that was my best movie of 2016. Cool, I saw it too. I liked it. Yeah, it's a good one. But I disagree as it being the most visually stunning movie of 2016. Get out of town. You are incorrect. Uh, this because is the internet. I think my movie <laughs> would drive up with its in its car, and the two brothers would jump out and they'd punch your movie's visual styles in the face. Because my movie is hell or high water. My movie's got some tough gangsters in it, though. <laughs> but uh, my movie has Chris Pine, Ben Foster, and Jeff Bridges, and they are in an action drama about two brothers who turned to crime to save their family's land and the Texas Ranger played by Jeff Bridges who was out to stop them. Um, This is a modern Western that is so relevant it hurts, especially after the election. This is the ultimate movie of F you to corporations and banks. Yeah, for real. Um, Hell or High Water is this very small, very uh, uh, simple movie with so many uh, uh, browns and oranges and greens that it like... It's the answer to Moonlight's Blues and Purples. Exactly. And it, literally the best cinematography of the entire year. It is uh, filled with all these images of small towns, of uh, billboards that show debt relief. These are all real towns and real places. Can, it, can I just kind of sidebar and ask sure. you, as someone from a small town, did you find that to be an accurate portrayal of what that's like? They are real. You can tell. As, uh, this is this is an interesting thing. And I, and I, anybody out there that grew up in a small town, I grew up in a. I grew up. I didn't even grow up in a town. I grew up in the middle of the country, mm-hmm. uh, as we called it, in the middle of nowhere. I grew up two miles from a town. The the town that was two miles away is called Stark, Kansas. It has 70 people in it. <laughs> it's a small town. 70. Doesn't even have a stoplight. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Doesn't even have a store. Has a post office and a bank and a couple of churches and a bunch of houses and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a person from a small town, I can always tell when a small town is faked mm-hmm. on movies. Not faked. These were all real towns. I, I did some research. Even though the movie is set in Texas, they shot it in eastern New Mexico on the Texas border. Close enough. New Mexico has some nice tax incentives. That's the reason why they shot there. Um, <laughs> but those towns 
there actually was a town in that movie that I swear to God I thought I had been to. Maybe um, you've driven through it. Well, because it looked like a town in Texas. Mm-hmm. That, and I was like, I'm pretty certain that's that town in Texas. It wasn't. It was in New Mexico. But it looked so real that I thought for sure I had been there. Crazy. Um, this movie opens with a long one shot that lets you see that they are shooting in real places. It really does this amazing setup. The most interesting thing about this movie is that this movie could have been set in 1875 because the story is so simple about two bank robbers. It's it. It's really about the relationship. Yes. And this is without a doubt... Chris Pine's best performance of all time. I would also, um, I would, I would hazard it's Ben Foster's best performance as well. I would, I would give you that. I think um, this is an interesting case of a movie where every scene and every character is memorable. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me remind you: in this movie, there's a scene with a waitress who's played by Katie Mixon, who is tipped by the robber. She's tipped two hundred dollars, yeah, yeah. and when Jeff Bridges shows up, she refuses to surrender the two dollars in tip money uh, because. She wants the Rangers to get a warrant because she needs that $200 to pay off her mortgage. Yeah, and that's why he gave it to her in the first place. Yes, she was was complaining about her mortgage. Like, and she's only in one scene. Yeah, Um, and she's great. Also, you could freeze frame any frame of Hell or High Water and you'd be looking at an amazing work of art. It's that stark. It's that bleak. It is... Uh, ever since I saw it, it was like I knew it was going to be my my movie of the year. Now, Moonlight came very close, mm-hmm. but I think Hell or High Water hit so much closer to home for me. And I think it is so much a case of being real. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I would say it is less stylized. Moonlight, possibly because it was originally a play. Yes. Um, it does feel stylized in a way that I think Hell or High Water doesn't. Yes. Hell or High Water is also like a mean movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a mean It's movie. a mean movie. But, you know, that's the point of it. Mm-hmm. And, and that is why Hell or High Water is easily my movie of 2016. Yes. Now, let's talk about some honorable mentions. Ashley, do you have any movies that almost made it on there? Moana, uh, Moana of course. Moana, obviously. Moana is also in my honorable mentions as well. Take that. Moana is amazing. Um, for a long time, my choice was going to be 10 Cloverfield Lane, mm-hmm. which came out um, earlier this year. Like in April, I believe. Uh, or March. If, or if not earlier than that. I just thought it was so incredible. And again, a very simple movie yep. until sort of the final scene. Um, very beautiful, very well acted, very simple. Like it's just an, it's just an escape from a cellar kind of story. Um, and it really struck me and made me excited for franchising that one out. Um and then we added the comic book category, so that kind of swept a yes. couple a couple other things uh, out of my, my uh, movie. My other honorable mention that I want to mention is an, also a movie that came out very early in the year, and it got forgotten by a lot of people. The Nice Guys by Shane Black. Oh, I like The Nice Ryan Guys. Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe is just a solid, enjoyable movie. And to be honest with you, I think Ryan Gosling's best performance he's ever done. Screw La La Land, his best performance he's ever done is in The Nice Guys. I, I will definitely agree with that. So, all right. So we added this new category because there are so many of them. Let's move right into comic book movies. Yeah. Uh, now, Ashley, um, what was your comic book movie of 2016? There's a whole bunch of Suicide Squad, Batman v Superman came out. Deadpool. Uh, Deadpool, X-Men came out. Civil War. Civil War came out. What is, your, what is your What is your movie, Doctor Strange? What is your, uh, what is your, Comic movie of the year. Uh, my comic movie of 2016 has my British boyfriend in it, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, for me, sans question, it had to be Doctor Strange. Uh, I'm going to lean in here because it is also my choice for best comic book movie of 2016, uh-huh. Doctor Strange. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> of course, you know, it's the former neurosurgeon who embarks on a journey of healing only to be drawn to the world of the mystic arts based on the Marvel comic book. Uh, Ashley, what is it your comic book movie of 2016? I love an origin story, as I've said many, many times here on the podcast, and I'm really sick of Marvel brand of origin stories. Um, I wasn't a fan of Ant-Man for that and, and several other reasons, and I think that Doctor Strange really pared down their classic origin story in a really interesting way. I love that it didn't just rely on jokes, which I think is a yep. fault of some of their more recent movies, and I think that it is... Uh, the most cerebral because it is detached and it has a lot to teach you. It was like with the first Thor movie. There's so much mythology to bring in. And even though it's all pseudoscience in that comic booky way, if you don't buy into it as the audience member, the movie doesn't work. And I think that all of the cast does a really good job at folding you into this weird world. I think it's the only movie that 3D has ever been worth seeing in. And my issues with um, some of the casting aside, 
I really liked seeing Benedict Cumberbatch and Chiwetel Ejiofor um, as like a very attractive uh, white guy and black guy <laughs> leading the movie. I was all into that. So I think I just think Doctor Strange was incredible. I think I chose it because I think it's a hero's journey that I wrote down that is tethered in purples, acid greens, and altered states. <laughs> and the reason why I was thinking about Doctor Strange for a long time and trying to figure out why it was the Marvel movie that connected with me the most. Mm-hmm. And what I came up with is that his voyage of self-discovery mm-hmm. is very similar to 2005's Batman Begins. Ah, one of your favorite comic book movies. I love Batman Begins. Um, and, and, you know, and both movies are these men who become almost gods among their training in, during low-key lighting scenes. And <laughs> they, they both work because they're simple. Mm-hmm. And the thing that Doctor Strange shares with Batman Begins is Doctor Strange has a stellar cast. Mm-hmm. Tilda Swinton, Mads Mikkelsen, you talked about uh, uh, who played Bear Mordo. Oh, should we tell A.G. of Yes, thank you. Uh, Benedict Wong. Benedict Wong. I love Benedict uh, Wong. And Batman Begins did the same thing. Such a strong cast, and it's very simple. And also, I'm going to point out that um, you talked about that you were getting tired of the Marvel method of making movies. I am, and I'm not saying that Well, I don't want to go down that, that big long road. I'm just tired of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I am tired of the crappy Marvel post credit scenes because oh, I for real though because I I don't think they've been good in a while and I can still remember Nick Fury walking into Iron Man one and it giving me chills and ever since then not many of them have like really made me like besides like Thanos going into his closet and grabbing a glove and being like I gotta take care of this. Well, I don't care. I'm because, I'm asleep because they're not cameos. They're cameos now. They're not plot devices. They're they're not. These exciting setups Mm -hmm. for the next movie, they're just become these deleted scenes. Mm -hmm. And Doctor Strange's post credit scene, um, I'm going to spoil it big time here because if you haven't seen this movie, I'm sorry. Where he's talking to Thor. Yeah. And it's a direct setup for Thor 3. I literally was like, Doctor Strange is going to be in Thor 3. This is awesome. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, And it really... it. It was so interesting because the thing I liked about Doctor Strange so much that it was disconnected that for a while there I kind of thought it was taking place in the Marvel Universe and then Thor shows up and you're like, oh my God, it's in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. You know, um, and it was so refreshing to feel the Marvel Universe once we had stepped away from it for a little it bit. It is very divorced from the Avengers Universe that we know. Well, it, it, it's an interesting perspective that I wonder if we'll get the same feeling when we see Star-Lord meet Captain America. I hope so. Like because because you're right, it was exciting. Because the Guardians are so far removed from that Marvel universe that once they actually enter the main Marvel universe, I wonder if we'll be like, wow, it'll be like them entering the Matrix. It, well, that's what I felt with the post credit scene. Yeah. Um. And and man, Doctor Strange easily the best comic book movie of 2016. I'm also dying for Benedict Cumberbatch and Tom Hiddleston to play opposite each other. It's gonna be so great. Uh, that'll be good. Be a British off. All right, let's move straight into uh, television. Television. Now this includes streaming, of course, because there are so stream- many streaming services and stuff like that. But Ashley, mm-hmm. what is your best television show of 2016? Correct. Well, I. Almost gave it to Luke Cage, but I felt like I would only responsibly give it give it to the first six episodes. Which would be a terrible choice for the best of 2016. Uh, right, which is not the whole season. Not Luke Cage, but I'm saying like only giving half a yeah, season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I do think that the first six episodes of Luke Cage are tremendous. Um, everyone should go check it out. But this year... Um, you and I finally cracked and watched a series that we'd been talking about watching for approximately 100,000 years. Seinfeld. <laughs> we did. Did rewatch Which Seinfeld. is not eligible for this because it came out in like 1987. Uh, that is correct. Uh, this <laughs> or 1990. Sh- this show, the fourth season of this show premiered in March of this year, and that is FX's The Americans. FX The Americans. Um, brief synopsis if you haven't heard of it, and it seems like nobody has. Uh, set in the early 1980s during the Cold War, The Americans is the story of Elizabeth and Philip Jennings, played by Kerry Russell and Matthew Reese, who are two Soviet KGB officers posing what? as an American married couple living in the northern Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C., and their neighbor, Stan Beeman, played by Noah Emmerich, the FBI agent working in counterintelligence. Virginia. Uh, if you're listening, state of Virginia, and I, and I, and I know you are, um, 
there are commies among you. There are. There are freaking commies. Um, the thing, I mean, the hook of the American, it's a great hook. It's a great elevator it's, pitch. Oh, man, that but, is the most amazing elevator pitch I've ever heard. Um, the great thing about the Americans is really, I think, Matthew Reese, who plays the leading man. Because yes. they are called upon throughout each season to take on the personas and the disguises that they use throughout their of missions. all these characters. Yes. yes. And he, their, their secret identities, basically. And he, I think, more than I've seen almost any other actor do, because Dollhouse had characters do, do things like this. Tons of spy shows have characters do things like this. He really inhabits each and every one of the characters that he's playing. He changes the way he walks, and then the way they design his look will change the way he appears. And then... His performance, coupled with the fact that um, they have a, they do such a good job at raising the stakes from arc to arc, from season to season, that I don't know how they've made it four seasons. When I watched the pilot, I didn't know how. <laughs> oh, they're they're like KGB agents living next to an FBI agent. Oh no, like how it would last a season, but they do it in such thoughtful, intelligent ways. FX is has been surprising me over the last couple of years with the quality of. Um, shows that they're pumping out. I would not have thought mm-hmm. that FX would be like this network with this, these amazing shows. The interesting thing is I feel FX is is slowly becoming like the second AMC. Like I AMC say, has like up right, Breaking right. Bad mm-hmm. and Walking Dead and some really other good stuff. And FX is like, especially with Justified and the Americans and, and they have uh, some great comedies this as Tom well. Hardy show that's going to be popping up there very soon. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, FX is sort of becoming this other like nice little stop off. Yeah. So it was a show that I was sort of prepared to not really like like um, it's been described as the greatest show that no one's watching, and that is true. Yep. I don't have anyone to talk to about it except Jason, and there's only two seasons left. Um, a thirteen. So it's ep- going to finish in the sixth season. Yes, yeah. so a th- thirteen episode and a ten episode, and I just I cannot recommend it enough. It is everything that you love about what cable television can do. Um, and streaming services that no one else can do. And the acting in it, I just think it's some of the best acting on television. So, nice. Yeah, The Americans. Cool. It's a good show. I agree. I totally agree with your choice. It's a strong television show that nobody is watching. Thank you. So what have you got on the slate if it's not The Americans? Well, I can't possibly imagine what you're going to well, say. Well, Ashley, <laughs> I have to tell you about a land <laughs> far off. In the desert. I thought it was a world. You always have a sound effect for It's a episodes. world. <laughs> Some could say a West world. <laughs> Where places, there are bars that play songs like this. <laughs> this is House of the Rising Sun. I know. By the animals. <laughs> it is amazing. I might just let it play the entire time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, if you have not watched Westworld, you're missing out that they like let they play uh, old piano versions of all these modern songs. And it's awesome. There is no way my choice could not be anything but Westworld. Not simply because I love Westerns, but because nothing else. And I love the Americas. I thought Matthew Reese did a really good job. He's so amazing. No television show in 2016 came close to the acting, the filmmaking, the emotion, the themes, and the just plain what the hell is going to happen next of Westworld. No television show hit that. Uh, if you don't know what this is, it's an HBO show, and the story takes place in a fictional Westworld, a technologically advanced Western-themed amusement park populated by androids that are dubbed hosts. Now, Westworld caters to high-paying visitors dubbed newcomers, or just guests, who can do whatever they wish within the park. They can have sex with whoever they want. They can just randomly kill people. They can torture people without fear of retaliation from the hosts or the robots. Anthony Hopkins plays the creator of Westworld while Jeffrey Wright plays his assistant Bernard I love him. and episode one starts out that there is a problem in the park and the season unfolds from there now there are some big bold questions of the nature of the soul uh, of this heart of Westworld um, are these hosts alive is it right to torture them if they're machines is this fake world more real than the real world and if that's so then how can you define what, what's real um, this show has dialogue that is poetry they uh, they they have twists and turns of the show. And here's the interesting thing about this show. A lot of science fiction shows, yes, this is a science fiction show. Mm-hmm. A lot of them, they have their plot devices. They have their turns. And you're like, where did that come from? That's mm-hmm. not set up. Westworld has those shocking turns. But Westworld is a Jonathan Nolan show. Mm-hmm. And Jonathan Nolan, unlike his brother Christopher, <laughs> lays a foundation 
so that if you're he doesn't hit you over the head with it, mm-hmm. but it's there and you can figure it out and you can actually figure it out before he'll surprise you. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter of a Jonathan Nolan show is that it's you're not looking for the surprise. You're looking for how will the surprise be revealed? I see. Um, so that way it's not about the surprise. It's about like, well, how are they going to discover that certain people are robots mm-hmm. because certain humans in the show are robots? Um, it is a show that you cannot even trust the editing. The editing of the show is a character and the show beats along with the editing and it beats along with the amazing music with the pieces like I played Mm -hmm. and the uh, amazing score. Um, this is a show that season one was dedicated to unlocking the secrets of the bicameral mind, which is a theory of artificial intelligence. Let me just state that again. Season one's theme <laughs> is unlocking the bicameral mind. Go Google that real quick. <laughs> yeah, they made a television show about that. Pretty freaking amazing, right? And it works. Um, plus, I will admit this. It has... It ends on sort of a cliffhanger, mm-hmm. but a cliffhanger that concludes the first season, and it has one of the best season two setups I have ever seen. The show in the second season will be completely different from season one, and I cannot wait to see it. This is science fiction at its best. It works, and I don't even want to talk to you about anything because like, it'll spoil anything. This is Jonathan Nolan at his best. Westworld is not one of the best television shows of 2016. Westworld is one of the best television shows since 2010. And you are you are a pre-existing Jonathan Nolan fan. I am a pre-existing Jonathan Nolan fan. I loved Person of Interest. Person mm-hmm. of Interest. Person of Interest was the science fiction show like the Americans. It was the science fiction show that nobody watched. Mm-hmm. But you go ask people on the street about Person of Interest and I have not heard one person tell me that Person of Interest sucks. Everyone's like, oh, that's a good show. Nobody watches it. Mm -hmm. Um, Person of Interest does the same thing. Person of Interest has a theme for its season. It concludes its season, and then the next season is completely different. And as you move into each season, also, by the way, Westworld has been confirmed it's going to be five seasons. Person of Interest, five seasons. Jonathan Nolan loves that five-act story. (laughs) Um, Westworld, I have not been excited to watch a show weekly this much since Lost. Mm. And a lot of people were like, well, yeah, but Lost didn't end right. Shut up. Go watch that show again if you think it didn't end right. Get out of here. Um, Westworld. <laughs> Getting really aggressive about the TV. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just find that um, my problem with uh, any, and, I, and I've, I'm certain I've stated this on the show before, my problem with anybody that has the problem with the ending of Lost mm-hmm. is that you you were in for the show for the answers, and that's not what the show was about. The show was about the characters. Mm-hmm. And like any good show, it's about the characters. It's not about the plot. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares about the plot. The plot is accessory. Exactly. You know, it's it's like Little Red Riding Hood. What's the plot? Oh, the wolf's going to eat her. Well, who cares? Mm-hmm. Why do we care if Little Red Riding Hood's eaten? We care because Grandma cares. Yeah. And because you know? she's going to look after her grandma. And because she's going to look after her grandma. That's what you care about in that story. You don't give a damn if the wolf eats her or not because we don't know Red Riding Hood. It's the same thing about Lost. Who cares about the damn smoke monster? We don't care. We care who, <laughs> who decides to go hunt the smoke monster mm-hmm. or why the smoke monster exists. Westworld is a show full of nuance and brilliance. And it is a show that I worry... The reason why I don't think it hit Game of Thrones level, because it is easily the successor to Game of Thrones, is because it is very smart. Mm -hmm. It is a very smart... It's a show that's way smarter than I am. Cool. (laughs) Um, Easily one of the best shows of 2016. Um, Yeah, so there you go. Uh, Ashley, did you have any honorable mentions for television? You, you mentioned Luke Cage. Uh, I did mention the first six the first six episodes of Luke Cage. I'm going to give an honorable mention to Daredevil season two. Um, I'm going to give an honorable mention to Star Wars Rebels because I oh. feel like this season it is finally the second season was way better than the first it was a huge jump in quality and I feel like this third season is really where the show should be and where it should live because now that the, uh, some of the characters are a little older it can deal with some more complex subject matter um, while still being a kid friendly show it's where Clone Wars was at its height mm-hmm. and I've been really enjoying watching it I'm going to give also an honorable mention to The Expanse mm-hmm. which is a great show on sci-fi that nobody watched um, it is very brilliant it's very smart and it takes you four episodes to get it mm-hmm. And but I kept watching it because I heard everybody talk about it it's a great 
it, it is the successor to Battlestar Galactica that nobody is watching. And I kind of hope it's coming back for a second season in, like, I think, about a month now. Mm-hmm. And I hope people will check it out because The Expanse is great. And I am super loving the new Supergirl on, oh, the, on the CW. All the CW shows, I think, I are think strong. I've been, I think I've been on fire. Especially in the second half. Yeah, but I really just, I think Supergirl's like really special now. And it's, we saw glimpses of it before, but it's cool to see the show firing on all cylinders yeah, now. Yeah, totally. All right, cool. Let's move into books. Books that have words and no pictures in them. Both they can have some pictures. Word books. But mostly books. Ashley. Jason. Now, we have this rule that for these books that it doesn't have to be a book that was published in this year. It I just don't has to think be a book. I read a book published in 20, I read one book published in 2016. I don't think I did either. <laughs> I read all books that were published in years before. Yes. So Ashley, what is your book of 2016 that you think people should check out? Um, the prose book that I read this year was actually published in 2011. So it's not that old. Um, it is Jeffrey Eugenides, The Marriage Plot. Now, I think unequivocally that Jeffrey Eugenides is the greatest American writer Uh, writing right now. I think that we should all strive to be as erudite and as thoughtful as he is. Um, You may know Jeffrey Eugenides for his two novels, um, The Virgin Suicide and Middlesex. Those are what he's best known for. And the brief synopsis of this is that the marriage plot concerns three college friends from Brown University, Madeline, Leonard, and Mitchell, beginning in their senior year in 1982 and follows them into their first year post-graduation. And Madeline is a head in the clouds, in love with a uh, Regency era romance kind of girl. Okay. And she has a best friend and she has a boyfriend. And it's about those, those the two, Mitch and Leonard? Mitchell and Leonard. Okay. Um, and it's about who she decides to marry and ruins her life. And then who she should have wound up with but ran away to India because he decided that he wanted to live like Gandhi. And oh. it's so, um, like, I can't even, it sounds like such a simple kind of love triangle. Is there a little bit of a thing in there, like, would they show you the alternate future that she could have had with the other guy? No. Okay. Um, but there is. Um, there, what, what makes you realize that she should have married the other guy? It, it tells you. Okay, got it. Uh, it tells you unequivocally because all three characters come together again at the end oh, and okay. you see that. You see sort of maybe how it could have gone, but not in like a flash forward or a flashback mm-hmm. kind of way. Um, and then Madeline has to decide if maybe she's better off on her own all along. And I like this book a lot because it is a really stark reflection of what we were all like at 22. Like, they're all really interesting characters, but they're all, like, kind of jerks. Okay. Um, But you also see what makes all of them special. You see how they're intelligent and they're thoughtful and what is great about all of them and how they all simultaneously ruin each other's lives. Like you said about TV, it's about the characters more than it is about the plot. The plot is just an extension of what they're interested in and to create a little bit of drama. Mm -hmm. And... Just for the, again, for the level of writing and the kind of words that you're going to come across, it's worth, it's worth checking out. It won a Pulitzer Prize, it won the Salon Book Award, and it won the Library Journal Best Book of the Year. And when, so, what year did it actually come out? 2011. Oh, wow. So, uh, you can find what it. You, what have you been doing for six years? Me? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, what? why did it take me six years to read it? Yeah. Oh, because I only read Middlesex in 2014. Oh, uh, okay. This should have um, been your pick on the best of 2011 list. Well, I didn't know you in 2011, there and we, we weren't doing the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like the That's most... That's no excuse. It's just the most beautiful thing I read this year, and I really, like, I, if I can encourage anyone to pick up anything that Jeffrey Eugenides has read, then my work here is definitely done. Nice. So, what is your best prose book? It's it's also The Marriage Plot, isn't well, it? Well, my book... Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, my book... Book, uh, was the Doctor Who coloring book? No, <laughs> <laughs> you do own that. <laughs> I do. Um, my actually, uh, my book was technically published in this year. Its hardcover was published in 2015. The soft cover was published this year. So I'm counting it as a 2016 oh, book. Second printing. Come on. I double checked my uh, my date while you were talking. <laughs> my, you had to get one up on me. I, I get did. It. I did. I had to be the best of 2016. Uh, the best <laughs> host of Geek History Lesson in yep. 2016. I, I'm hoping to win that award. Oh, uh, tell us on Facebook. Please tell us on Twitter who wins the uh, best the best host of Geek History Lesson 2016. Uh, if it's you, gonna be you, white men always win. I have a feeling it's gonna be DJ, <laughs> DJ Wolverich. That's who. Oh, you can't write in our guest professors. <laughs> Screw them. They're not here weekly. Uh, I mean, I think I'm gonna vote for DJ. So. <laughs> um, 
So my book is a biography Mm -hmm. um, that pulls back the curtain on a television show that I loved in my childhood. The uh, it's called Andy and Dawn: The Making of a Friendship and a Classic American TV Show. It is by Daniel Davies, V I S E with an accent. I might be saying that wrong. It is a lively and revealing biography of Andy Griffith and Don Knotts, and this humorous, informative, and poignant book celebrates the powerful real life friendship behind one of America's most iconic television programs. Uh, that, of course, is the Andy Griffith show. Andy Griffith played Hayden Griffith. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. And Don Knotts played Barney Fife. Andy, mm-hmm. um, nip it in the bud. Um, <laughs> uh, everybody's seen the Andy Griffith show. I love that show. I think it is one of the greatest pieces of American television stream ever. Stream it on Netflix. Ever. Yeah, you can stream it on Netflix. Um, it is fascinating Mm -hmm. to read the stories about these two men and how these two men were actually friends. Andy Griffith visited Don Knotts on his deathbed. Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. Andy and, and Andy and and Don were actually Andy and Barney were really real friends. And then like in reading the relationship, now there were points where they they grew apart, like any relationship, like any relationship. But then there were parts that they came back together. Um, but they, when Andy was making the Andy Griffith Show, he specifically called for Don because he had worked with Don on Broadway, mm-hmm. and he thought Don Knotts was amazing. And they talk about writing the show, and then when they wrote the show, it was like the writers and all the actors were there, literally writing the episodes together. That's so cool. Creative um, collaboration. I love that. Yeah, and it was so amazing. And they, and they, and it was the first idea that I heard about the concept that even though the show came out um, in like the 60s, they were like, well, this is the show that our fathers would have watched. Mm-hmm. And that was the idea about it because it was kind of a throwback to the past. It was supposed to be wholesome. Yes. And then even like they talk about like doing the Andy Griffith reunion special and stuff like that. And then hearing it's it, to me, it's interesting, especially since um, we live in Los Angeles to hear how Los Angeles operated in the past, oh, yeah. like how the entertainment industry operated back in the day. Like uh, I didn't know the story about Jim neighbors, Jim neighbors who played a uh, uh, Gomer pile. Oh yeah. You know, Golly. Not yeah, an actor. Shazam. Mm-hmm. He was a guy that they saw in a nightclub singing a song, and they were like, hey, come do a part. Anyone can uh, do that for me at any time. <laughs> uh, that's not the point of this podcast right now. We're talking about Andy and Dawn uh, and their beautiful relationship. Um, it is a fascinating book. If you have any interest in Andy Griffith, Dawn Knotts, or The Andy Griffith Show, this is an amazing book. Mm-hmm. And But I will tell you this. It is a little biased. Because it is written by Don Knotts' brother-in-law, which I didn't find out until after. But I, w- uh, but I will say this, because it, it kind of paints both of them in a little bit of a loving light. Mm-hmm. Although there are definitely plenty of um, Andy Griffith being a terrible person. Jabs at him? Yes. Uh, he, Andy Griffith sometimes was a crazy person. Don Knotts was a sane actor mm-hmm. who made career choices. Mm-hmm. Andy Griffith got a little insane sometimes. At least, at least that's how it comes across in the book. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and that's, th- I think that's fair to know that bias. Yes, there you go. And that was that. Was, that's my prose book of 2016. Nice. Let's move into podcasts, uh, where as we uh, point out our competitors, and uh, hopefully you don't skip out on this podcast and go to listen to them instead. Although caveat, we do not include any shows from networks that we are associated with or have friends that work on. So no morning. So no frog pants networks or nobody of the major spoilers network. Yes. Yes. Uh, that pretty much knocks out everybody over there. Sorry, guys. We love you. And we recommend checking out their work as well. Yeah. All right. Ashley, what's your best podcast of 2016? OK, so let's talk about BuzzFeed. I have mixed feelings about BuzzFeed as a news outlet. Is this going to be Cat Gifts or Us? Um, if that was a podcast, I'd probably listen to it. Um, because BuzzFeed is this weird conglomerate where they sometimes have these like amazing think pieces. Yeah. And sometimes they have listicles with cat gifts. And I'm into both. Yep. Um, so I do find myself there a lot. But I, they kind of fall in the middle for where I would consider like a journalistic outlet. Yeah. Uh, middle, I, don't, I don't even know if I would call them a journalistic outfit. Uh, I mean, th- they are. They have some, there's some stuff on BuzzFeed. But yeah. so BuzzFeed has a bunch of podcasts, which I learned this year, um, including this amazing podcast called See Something, Say Something. So the premise of See Something, Say Something is that the host Ahmed Ali Akbar gathers folks together to drink tea, tell 
tell stories and talk about being Muslim in America. Okay. Now, if this were an NPR podcast, he's a Muslim, correct? He is a Muslim. He's a practicing Muslim, born and raised, child of immigrants. Um, If this were an NPR podcast, it'd be like kind of dour and detached and very journalistic. Okay. But because it's a BuzzFeed podcast, I guess, and he has more control over it, it's super cool and interesting and uplifting. So okay. there's a whole episode that is takes it humorous? place. It is so funny. Okay. There's a whole episode that takes place in and around Muslims and pop culture, and they spend most of the time talking about uh, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, and okay. how she had impact in their lives, and talking about the first time they saw people on TV or animated characters that they felt like represented them. So they talk about Mindy Kaling a lot. Oh, and cool. He dresses up as Kamal Khan, so like a male version of Kamala. Oh, he's the Captain America um, with the chic that you see at Comic Cons. I think that's him, or that's someone he knows. Okay, got it. Um, and so, so that's maybe not him. Don't, uh, don't, don't, don't quote us. Um, but so he goes around and he he interviews a bunch of people who are dressed up like Miss Marvel, and he says like, "Oh, well, you're dressed up like her." Blah blah blah. Yeah. And he finds this little girl, and he asks her who made her costume, and she says like, "Allah made my costume." And then they have a whole episode on. How many episodes do they have, by the way? There are uh, nine episodes out right now. Okay, and are they a weekly? They are weekly. Yes. Okay. Um, I just think it's such an interesting lens to tackle such a difficult. Or, or, or like touchy subject yeah, matter yeah. in the current climate. And I don't know really anything about Muslim culture. Yeah. So I find it very fascinating. And I find Ahmed and his guest just like really cool people that I would want to hang out with. Nice. And they talk a lot about chai. So I'm totally on board. When it downloads, I listen to it right away. And it's really, I listen to a lot of pop culture podcasts. Yeah, so yeah. this is a different it's it's a little bit of like a departure. Ours. Yes. Ugh. Ugh, Geek History. So it's, tiring. It's just a departure from what I usually listen to. So sure. I'm always very excited to listen to it, and I cannot recommend it enough. Um, yeah. Go learn something about uh, the genie myths, because I didn't know more than the blue guy. Oh, cool. Yeah. So The, g- the gins. The genes. The genes? Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. And, and the, I, always or, or the gin. I always pronounce the D on that. You don't say the D. The gin. They all tell the story about, apparently, gin myths are specific to regions and to families, each family has a gin story what? and they all like tell like this was my father's gin story this was my grandma's gin story it's fascinating so what do you have for your best podcast of 2016 Jason Be well that. <laughs> I could have done a podcast about politics because mm-hmm. you know this is the year of politics that's true I could have done a podcast about comic books but I decided not to I decided to pick a podcast that kind of came out of nowhere mm-hmm. based around a TV show that ran from 1999 to 2006. Uh-huh. This is the West Wing <laughs> Weekly, hosted by Joshua Molina and Rishi K. Sherway, the co-hosts of this podcast. The two hosts have set an ambitious goal for themselves, discuss all 154 episodes of the critically acclaimed Emmy Award winning series. And the interesting thing about this is that I am a huge West Wing fan. West Wing is one of my favorite television shows of all time. I like to rewatch the entire series every time there's a presidential election. Mm-hmm. I just finished it this year. And then this podcast appeared. And Rishi is a host. He's in a couple of music uh, podcasts like Song Exploder. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because he was friends with Joshua Molina, who was on the West Wing. Will played, Bailey. He played Will Bailey on the West Wing. And he, I guess he just sort of convinced Josh to come <laughs> do the show with him. And it, and it really adds to the show because Josh is able to pull actors that were actually on the West Wing to be their guests. So, you know, because there's a lot of like recap TV show podcasts out there and they're some of them are good, some of them not that great. It brings a level of legitimacy that not everybody has. Well, it does an interesting thing of pulling the curtain off behind the show. Like Aaron Sorkin was on their season finale for uh, season one when they finished season one. Mm-hmm. And then you hear a story about like um, the pranks of putting electronic equipment in Bradley Whitford's car after 9-11 to get him pulled over by sec- Warner Brothers security. And and then, like, uh, the actor who played Toby, Richard Schiff, he came on the episode and he cried over the episode. I, this is a fun podcast, and it's so cool to go revisit, like, one of my favorite series of all time. And it's one of those weekly TV show podcasts that I don't mind listening to it. If you've never seen The West Wing, this might be the perfect way for you to get into it. Is to watch an episode every week and mm-hmm. then go listen to their commentary. Because the actors on the show are so fascinating. And I am... So excited. And I hope one day they get Martin Sheen. 
Oh, man. Because I think that will be their greatest episode of all time. Um, The West Wing Weekly, easily, in my opinion, the best podcast of 2016. Nice. All right, Ashley, now it's time to dive into our most self-indulgent category, the best geek history lesson episode of 2016. Now, we had a lot of episodes during this time. We crossed the 100th episode during this time. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, we did the amazing and fantastic best of 2015 during this time, (laughs) which I think might be your pick. But, Ashley, what is your favorite? episode, excuse me, that we did this year. Well, we did a lot of really good episodes yep. and we hit a couple milestones. We crossed episode 125 and nah, I... Nobody cares about that one. Um, I care about that nah, one. Uh, nah. I am going to selfishly pick a two-part episode so I get two for the price of one. Oh my god. Um, and one that I taught so that I can be <sighs> extra self-congratulate. You're, I think you're, you're diving... You're not going to win the best uh, host of Key Here's Lesson. DJ has got this oh. sewn up. Watch me. Um, I am I would say that Teen Titans Part 1 and Part 2 are my favorite geek history lessons of this year. Why? Because I love the Teen Titans and I finally got to dive into that. I got to reread a lot of really cool stuff for that. And I've been waiting to do the Teen Titans podcast since we started. I'm going to put you on the spot right here. Mm-hmm. Do you have the episode numbers? 125 and 126. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say them already? Yes. <laughs> See, I was trying to knock you down a couple points. I knocked myself down a couple points. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was just something that I waited. A re- it was like Tim Drake. Like, I waited so long mm. to find mm. just the perfect moment to slot them in. And it was just really gratifying to get to teach everyone. It's great doing this every week, but when you get to talk about something that you super, super love, yeah. it's extra special. Cool. Yeah. So what do you think was our uh, was our best moment this well, year? Well, I went for, because I don't really want to talk about this category that long, because mm-hmm. it is very self-indulgent, <laughs> but we only did it last year because Soe suggested it. I'm going to pick uh, episode 108, Superman, the Golden Age. It is an episode ah, that I that taught. That you taught. But... <laughs> It was the hardest episode to research ever. Mm-hmm. We learned a lot of interesting things about Superman. It was one of our longest episodes ever. And it started off this interesting Superman thing along with Batman that we will repeat sometime this year. I guarantee you that sometime we are going to dive deep into Superman the Silver Age. Yes. It was the first episode where we discovered that, oh, some of these characters were going to have to do them by ages because there was just so much to unpack. There's so much. Yeah, like Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman got to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like we, eventually, I guarantee you this year, I can confirm, <laughs> yeah. you will get Wonder Woman the Golden Age. I'm super psyched for that. So Maybe that'll be my best of 2017. Yeah, there you go. I don't know. There you go. Yeah, I didn't pick best of 2015. Man, who would have thought? Okay. Uh, I think that does it for our big best of 2016. Um, you know, lists of geek history lesson, our self-indulgent categories, and mm-hmm. all the other pop culture-y things. Um, but I just want to tell everybody out there that if you enjoyed our best of 2016, then you might want to listen to our worst of 2016 list, which you can only hear on Geek History Lesson Extra, which is our exclusive podcast on our Patreon at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. We have over 50 episodes now of Geek History Lesson Extra, and you can hear them all at Patreon.com slash Jawin. Uh, and also, don't forget that there are plenty of other places to listen to this podcast as we close out our first episode of 2017. You can find this podcast on Stitcher. You can find this podcast on SoundCloud. And now you can find it on Audio Boom. Woo! And don't forget to go check us out on iTunes and leave us a review over there because if you do, we'll read it on the show. We're going to read a review from a lovely listener called Green Luva. Nice. Who said, I have been listening to GHL for almost two years now, and I have to say it is the best podcast I've ever listened to. Aww. I love the chemistry between Ashley and Jason. They make my work day so much better. I get so excited at the beginning of each week that there is a new episode to listen to. If you have any interest at all in comic book characters or pop culture, you have to listen to this podcast. Exclamation point, exclamation point. Ashley and Jason, thank you for doing this week in, week out. You bring me and my wife a lot of joy and knowledge, and we get to talk about about things together and share about these things with our friends. Keep up the good work. A husband and wife team yes. that listen to Geek Country Lesson Extra and more. Thank you guys. That's so awesome. Now, Ashley, if they want to suggest future episodes for Geek History Lesson like the Best of 2017 list, where can they do that? <laughs> they can suggest Best of 2017 <laughs> over at facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson and geekhistorylesson.com. There's a ton of different ways to contact us in both places. That's right. And you can vote for the best host of Geek History Lesson on our Twitters. <laughs> 
for Ashley, that's at Ashley V. Robinson. For me, it's at, at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. I really think DJ Woolridge uh, is going to win. Uh, <laughs> that's it for this uh, Geek History Lesson. First of 2017. Yeah. How do you feel? Old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's it for, uh, for that's it for a geek history lesson this week. I'm Jason. Uh, maybe I need some new spectacles in them. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson and Professor Ashley. Will you please, old <laughs> Professor Ashley? Will you please close out this podcast? Well, well clash is dismissed and get off my lawn. What? <laughs>